Where is he? That's right. He sends me every year in the spring a picture of a tree with a few buds coming off of it. It's like the one person who's ever remembered tree and bud. He was the kicker for Notre Dame, right? Hunter? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let me get folks' attention. Hate uh, stifling conversation, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm even going to stifle our two chief residents uh, conversing in the back corner there. Uh, Peter, congratulations, made it through your first few hours as an attending at Heinz. Hopefully, the same can be said for your patience. Okay, um, today's topic um, an intro to events. You know, the reality is that, like most things, you learn events by dealing with them on a day to day basis rather than an abstract lecture. But very early on in the year, most of you encounter a patient who's attached to event, either because you're actually in the MICU, um, you're in the CCU, uh, or you're cross covering, or you have a patient that after an RT gets tubed and you're responsible for them a little bit before they go to the ICU. So when those circumstances arise, maybe this would be a resource you could use. Um, there's a whole lot of things we could go through. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on the troubleshooting and a little bit of like how to sound like a doctor on rounds, but I am also going to go through some initial vent settings. And then if time allows, we'll discuss a, a weaning strategy just because like Loyola is the uh, like weaning center of the world with Martin to Tobin's research. Uh, but if there's not time for that, that's fine as well. I am not going to talk about, you know, specific and usual modes of ventilation, um, BiPAP, Premise of hypercapnia. I mean, there's just all kinds of endless topics that we could. So most of our ventilators look something like this. Okay. There are, there's a, you know, a graphic interface that has three key sections. We recently, over the last six months, did purchase a bunch of new ventilators that have a different appearance, but they have the same three general areas of, of interest. Um, on, on these rectangular ones, the top portion is what's actually happening. Okay, and maybe, you know, an important one up there is that C, which you can see in the corner here. It could be a C, an A, or an S. Just to say what those are, if it flashes a C, it means it was a controlled breath that just happened, one that you were in charge of. You told the machine to do something at that point in time. So in English, in assist control, you're going to set a rate. If, if it's just time based upon that rate for a breath to be delivered, the C will flash. On the other hand, if the patient wanted an extra breath and breathed in and triggered the machine and asked the machine to assist the patient, it'll flash an A. And then if it's a completely random, spontaneous breath and S. But you know, the details of this, we're not gonna go through all of them, but it, it contains this, you know, what type of breath just happened. It's important that it'll print out what the peak pressure is. Very importantly are these graphs, which unless you change them, will have two graphs, one which shows the airway pressure versus time, and then the flow versus time, a little less important, but the airway pressure versus time will come back to this. So the top part's what's happening. It's like you set some settings, but what's actually happening is up at the top. Now, the next section is the settings sections where not you, I can't emphasize this enough, but the respiratory therapist will enter the settings that you may have put an order in for or discussed with the respiratory therapist, but you should not be fiddling with the settings yourself. But the settings are where you'll have the mode, you know, the rate, the volume, or the pressure in the eye time, the FiO2 and the PEEP, and all kinds of other things that are kind of set in the background. Alarms, so that if the machine isn't doing what should be happening, it beeps to alert somebody. Um, various things such as that. So the, the, that section is the settings. And I can't emphasize enough that you just cannot touch that area. It used to be kind of a joke, but people get into huge trouble, sometimes trouble just because it's a policy. And if you're in the wrong ICU and a, you touch the ventilator and a respiratory therapist identifies it, they're gonna submit a voice report. It's completely indefensible. There's nothing I can do uh, to keep the administration from coming down hard on the person who made an inappropriate vent change, whether we like it or not, that's a policy. I think some of the reason behind the policy is important. Um, how many of you have ever interviewed for a job? Okay, every one of you at some point in the last year or two interviewed for this job. Um, on that day, you had to get up on time for your interview, correct? 
how did you manage to get up on time for that interview? Did you, like back in the old days, if you went on an interview and sat in a hotel room, did you trust your ability to set the bedside alarm clock to get up in the morning? No, you asked for a wake up call, you set your iPhone, you had your mom call to wake you up. None of you trusted your ability to set a bedside alarm clock accurately. The ventilators, life support. Okay, don't fiddle with it. I, I just can't emphasize this enough, you know, in uh, uh, you know, UFC and things, they say the last words to the person, uh, protect yourself at all times in the ring, protect yourself uh, from getting uh, uh, in a lot of trouble. Don't touch the ventilators. Um, there, is, there are a couple of things you can touch at the very bottom. There are a couple of buttons, uh, pause buttons that you will press that allow you to measure resistance and compliance and also allow you to look for auto peep. That's kind of vents 202 down the road, not necessarily today. But very importantly, there's a button called the silence button so that if the machine is beeping, you can press that button. It'll stop beeping for two minutes. I would advise you to use those two minutes to get out of the room so that when somebody comes in to see why it's beeping, they don't blame you for that problem. So general layout of our ventilators. When it comes to initial ventilator settings, you know, at some point along the way, you will be specifically the person making these decisions. You know, right now it's probably your senior resident or the fellow or attending, um, but the most common vent setting we're gonna use is assist control, volume control. There's a few options, a few meaning like at least 20 different vent setting options. I always start literally 100% of the time with ACVC. So that's the one I would plan on starting with. ACVC is assist control, volume control. Old doctors refer to it as volume control. Younger doctors, assist control, but what it's really called is assist control, volume control. Meaning the machine is going to deliver a volume, a tidal volume, but will also assist the patient if they want more breaths per minute than you said. So assist control, volume control. When you pick ACVC, you will then also have to put in a rate and a tidal volume. I'll go through this in a moment, but your starting vent setting uh, is pretty much always going to be ACVC. That being the case, about half the time I end up switching subsequently to ACPC, assist control, pressure control. In ACPC, the ventilator is going to push in a certain pressure and maintain it for a certain time called our inspiratory time before letting it out. And we'll go through that detail in a moment. So ACVC is what I start with, but you're going to see a lot of patients with um, ACPC. And then you also will see some patients on what's called ACVC plus, which in effect is referred to as pressure control for dummies um, in that the machine kind of does what your brain would be doing otherwise. But just in case you see ACVC plus, A, don't fiddle with anything, but know that in effect, it's ventilating the patient in a pressure controlled fashion. So those are the two most common modes. You know, if you visit a surgical unit, you may see patients on SIMD or even more commonly SIMD plus pressure support. And as part of weaning, we'll occasionally take care of patients and pressure support, but I'm just going to leave those uh, to the side for the time being. So ACVC plus is where we're going to start. And of course, whatever mode you pick, you're also going to set an FiO2 and a P. All right, so picking the mode. So to understand how these things work, um, we need to be familiar with how a normal person would breathe. So relatively normal appearing person, Matt Collins in front, if I uh, knocked him out and tubed him, and then measured the pressure in his airway. When he breathes in, he would drop his airway pressure. And when he exhales, the airway pressure would go up. So a normal person breathing spontaneously, meaning without the ventilator doing anything, would drop the pressure in their airways during inspiration and it would go up during expiration, pretty simple. So with that background, let's see that, how that looks in assist control, volume control. And assist control volume control, you said two things, a rate and a tidal volume. So every so often based upon the rate you set, the machine is gonna do something. And since it's a volume mode, what that something is, is the machine is gonna deliver a tidal volume of air. So as the machine pushes in that tidal volume, the airway pressure is gonna go up. So it's the opposite of our chief resident breathing spontaneously, where during inspiration, the pressures go down in his airway with positive pressure ventilation, when the machine pushes a breath in, the airway pressures go positive or up. So airway pressure would go up and come back down until it's time for the next breath to go in. In ACVC, if the patient wants an additional breath, a, a frequency above the set rate, so in English, you set the rate at 12, but they want a 13th breath in that minute, they can get it and the machine will assist them. 
And how the machine knows that the patient wants another breath is that the patient breathes. Okay, if we set the rate at 12 and the patient want an extra breath, the patient would just breathe. So that would mean move the chest out, creating a little negative deflection in the pressure because the patient started to breathe in and that triggers the machine to push in the same size tidal volume it was gonna push in a moment later anyway. So the patient always gets the set tidal volume. That's why we like to start with it. It's, it's not very variable. You put in a tidal volume, the patient's always gonna get that tidal volume either because it was time to get it based upon the rate you set or because the patient asked for a breath. Now to put some you know, numbers on this, how much does a patient have to drop their airway pressure in order to get a full tidal volume in? And by comparison, how much of that pressure drop does that compare to a maximum effort? So let's put English on that. I have my intubated chief resident and I strangle him and he sucks in his hard as he possibly could. How negative of a pressure do you think he could generate in his airway on a maximum, like he puts all his might into it. How negative of a pressure could he generate? Devin, what do you think? Five. You think he could do five? Really? It's disappointing is what your chief is saying. Any normal person can generate minus 100 or more centimeters of water pressure. And in the ICU, you'll measure a NIF periodically, a negative inspiratory force to see if somebody's strong enough to wean. And we'll generally say it should be minus 40, 50, 60, but a normal person, anyone here, can generate minus 100. And to trigger the vent, the patient only has to drop their airway pressure by two. So the person's capable of doing 100, they have to drop by two. So the maximum work the patient ever has to do is just enough to like barely imagine an extra breath expand their chest just a touch to drop the airway pressure. And therefore it's a very good mode for resting the patient. And right when we intubate the patient is our goal to exercise them or to rest them. Well, it's to rest them because the reason you intubate the patient is they look like they were gonna die. Like right when someone's dying is not when you put them on an exercise program. So ACVC, you set a rate, you set a volume, you always get the same volume. And the maximum work the patient ever has to do is just barely enough to trigger an additional breath. Since most of your patients will be maintained on this, I'll pause for a moment to see if anybody has any questions about how, how ACVC works. All right. The other mode we use a lot is ACPC. So the ventilator, whether it's AC volume control or AC pressure control, the ventilator regardless is always just pushing air through the tubing into the patient. But in AC, BC, how much air the ventilator pushes is the volume you told it to come hell or high airway pressure. Like if you told it push in 500 cc's, it's gonna push in 500 cc's no matter how much pressure it took. Whereas in AC PC, it says control pressure control, the machine's gonna push air in. How much does it push it in? Well, it pushes in enough until the airway pressure that you set on the machine, a positive inspiratory pressure is hit. If you tell it push until the airway pressure is 20, it's gonna push until the airway pressure is 20, whether that's a little air or a lot of air. And then to make it really confusing, when you use ACPC, you also set what's called an inspiratory time, which is how long the machine is gonna maintain that pressure in the airway before letting it out. So the machine pushes in until the airway pressure target you set is hit and holds it in for the length of your inspiratory time. Why would we wanna do this? Well, by definition, you're setting the inspiratory pressure, the maximum pressure the airways, the alveoli will ever see. So you're in control of limiting barrow trauma, barrow pressure trauma. The idea if you take a normal intern and give them high tidal volumes and high pressures, they will develop uh, ARDS from lung damage down the road. In ACPC, you get to limit that pressure. That's the main benefit. The additional thing is that for a lot of patients, it's more comfortable. You can't predict that, but it's just true. Um, and we specifically use this in refractory ARDS, where you want to keep the alveoli open for as long a time as possible to enhance gas exchange. So for refractory hypoxemia, to limit barotrauma, and for some patients to make them more comfortable. Now, there are negatives to ACPC. Um, one of them is that if you make the inspiratory time too long, 
you may not have time for the patient to fully exhale before the next breath comes in, and you can get breath stacking and auto pee, extra pressure in the chest, limiting venous return, hypotension, shock, et cetera. But the real negative to ACPC is that it's confusing. And if I took my row of chief residents here and intubated all of them and gave them all 500 cc tidal volume, that wouldn't be perfect for any of them, but it wouldn't be way off either. Whereas I wouldn't know how much pressure and eye time for each one of them. Stephanie would need a lot of eye time, I can tell that. Um, uh, I don't know which combination of values would be ideal. And by the way, how do we set those values? Well, at the bedside, it's adjusting the PIP and the eye time until you get the tidal volume you want. So it takes experience, old age. It takes fiddling. And what are the best eye time and PIP combos changes over time. You know, if somebody is in heart failure and has stiff lungs at the beginning, it may take a lot of pressure to get a volume in. As you diurese the patient, the edema leaves the lungs, the compliance improves, and if you don't change the pressure, now they're going to be hyperinflated. So it's confusing, changes over time, um, but we use it a lot. So since this is the second mode, and that'll be the end of modes, I'll pause for a moment and see if anybody has questions about ACPC. I should say the key is if you get called get called to see a patient on a ventilator for whatever reason, and they're on ACPC, what you want to look at is what's actually happening in terms of the size of the tidal volume being generated by whatever the PIP and I time are. So at, if we went back to the, I'm not gonna do it, the first picture of, of the ventilator and what's happening in the patient, one of the values will be the tidal volume the patient is getting. And if you have somebody in ACPC and their tidal volume is only 200 cc's, um, that seems like that might be a problem and would alert you to uh, you know, get your fellow involved at that point in time. So we wanna rest people at the beginning. I start everybody on ACVC. You then have to give them a rate. If you give a backup rate of 12, that's a reasonable place to start. Um, but you wanna make sure the patient has an adequate minute ventilation. What do I mean by that? If right before intubating the patient, the patient was really tachypnic, like breathing 30 times a minute. When you intubate them, they get some, you know, succinylcholine and automatate. So now they're not breathing at all. If they go from 30 breaths a minute down to 12, that could leave them with a pretty big gap in terms of how much minute inhalation they need, and they could become hypercapnic. So picking the exact respiratory rate, a little bit of an art at the bedside as well. Now, what tidal volume would you uh, uh, give Hina uh, if I chose to intubate her right now? Again, anybody have a, a suggestion? You'd give her six cc's, Francis, is yeah. what you're saying? Six cc's, six, six cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight, okay? It used to be we put everybody in 500 cc's. We don't, we use math. So it's six cc's per kilo of ideal body weight. Ideal body weight is basically determined by height. So really we should be like setting this based upon uh, centimeters or height, but I have no idea whether I'm like 100 or 200 centimeters tall. So uh, we tend to still use this six cc's per ideal. Uh, kilogram body weight. Um, and then when it comes to the PEEP, pretty much everyone on earth except for Martin Tobin, the testifier in the Chauvin trial, who also knows a little bit about uh, ventilators. Um, everyone else on earth starts everybody on five centimeters water PEEP to begin with and then goes up if they need it in order to achieve adequate oxygenation. He starts everybody in zero. Maybe over time, we'll all do that. Um, but uh, most places they'll just start people in five and then we'll start everybody in 100% FiO2. Even though, you know, Magda looks relatively well oxygenated to me right now and she's maintaining adequate oxygenation on room air. So theoretically, if I intubated her, she ought to just need room air afterwards. But we always put people on 100% to begin with because we don't want to leave a controllable variable uncontrolled during something that's kind of life-threatening like intubating somebody. But what's the problem with 100% FiO2 over time? What does the patient develop? If I took a normal chief resident that qualifies and put him on 100% FiO2 over a few days, what's the problem he'll experience? What's the word for it? Oxygen toxicity, you know, free radical generation. He'll develop ARDS. So we don't, don't like leaving people on a toxic level of FiO2. We'll define toxic as 60 uh, as more than 60%. So we'll start on 100% and then just rapidly at the bedside, turn the FiO2 down to whatever level you can get down to while maintaining an adequate pulse oximeter. You don't need to 
check ABGs between each FIO2 change. So if you put everybody on these settings, you'd be okay. Okay, initial ventilator settings. Okay, all right. Um, every year when I do this, I run one sheet of paper. The next slide we're gonna have by some MICU nurses to see if they have any suggestions for what they really want our interns to be doing. The number one thing is they'd like you to like inform them that you just intubated their patient uh, and talk over a bunch of details. So uh, you need to put in an order for a sedation strategy. You know, if you're on the floor, your patient decompensates, they need to get intubated. As soon as you decide to press the button to get respiratory there to, to, and anesthesia to get the patient intubated, you need to talk with the nurses to discuss a sedation strategy so they can order it up from pharmacy. The nurses aren't carrying around syringe fulls of fentanyl in their pockets. If so, we have a different problem. So discuss the sedation strategy, because when the anesthesiologist and his or her attending intubate the patient, they're given succinylcholine, they're completely paralyzed, nice and calm, et cetera. But as soon as they pack up their bag and walk out of the room, those medications wear off and now the patient is awaking, you know, the intern is happy to dive across the patient to hold them down. So talk about a sedation strategy. And the sedation strategy today, the year of our Lord 2021, is very different than it was just two years ago. Two years ago, we would have said, put everybody on a continuous infusion of Versed, a benzodiazepine, that's out. Now the strategy should be PRN-based, just if they need it, targeted to a RAS score of zero, which is basically calm, not completely, completely comatose like a couple of you are now, but also not violent. Um, so just a patient who's you know, calm and conversing with you and opiate-based. So PRN targeted to a RAS of zero, opiate-based. 50% of patients don't need any sedation at all. By the way, I don't think I'm in that 50% if you intubate me, I like maybe a little bit of sedation, but uh, the, the literature says half of patients don't need to be sedated at all. You can just kind of talk them through it. And interestingly, when you measure PTSD in a post ICU syndrome kind of uh, analysis, patients who go through getting intubated in the ICU are often traumatized by that. But the incidence of PTSD is way less in patients who were less heavily sedated than in those who were heavily sedated. And the concept, I guess, is that both patients are experiencing the same amount of trauma. The heavily sedated patient subconsciously can't like process it appropriately, whereas the ones that are kind of aware and understanding what's happening, the data say come out with less uh, PTSD. Regardless of that, um, if you use a continuous infusion or use a continuous infusion of Versed, a benzodiazepine, it, it has the risk of delaying when you can get the patient extubated. So PRN, targeted to a RAS and opiate based. Um, comments from any of the old folks about, does this really work? Do you have any nuances to your sedation strategy? Any comments? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's bringing up uh, a separate issue of uh, interaction with uh, the, the ICU nurses. Um, I can tell you my first day of internship, you know, we admitted a patient, helicoptered in from Kankakee, which I thought was in Florida. I didn't realize it was a couple hours away from here. And uh, my, my senior resident who was going into rheumatology, uh, truly just like didn't want to be in the ICU. So my first night of internship, I'm admitting this transfer patient on my own. I didn't know what to do. So like I asked the respiratory therapist, what would be usual and customary settings? Um, I asked the respiratory, I mean, the, the radiology technician to look at the x-ray with me. Does the ET tube look about right? Um, and then I did whatever the nurse told me to do regarding sedation. And I think that's still a good strategy. So yes, of course, it has been discussed with their nurses. I think going from PRN up to needing a continuous infusion often leaves a period of time where the PRN is inadequate and that causes some problems. So starting high, but going low quickly is another strategy. As you know, from personal experience, when I don't have a clear answer, I just keep on talking. So I'm kind of demonstrating that right now. Yes, nurses are aware of it. I would do what the nurses want, but in the long run, we ought to be targeting this strategy. By the way, if you were to Google sedation strategy, uh, 
uh, for ventilated patients, the number one name you would find in the world's literature is someone named Ann Pullman, who's a nurse who was from Loyola, that I made the mistake when I was a fellow at U of C of recruiting her there um, to help run some clinical trials. And she's done all the literature in the world on uh, sedation management in the ICU, um, early weaning, and all of those things. So it really is nursing driven, but hasn't caught on everywhere. So talk with the nurse about a sedation strategy. Um, you should anticipate at least hypotension post intubation. Now, if I took you know the, the five plus one uh, chief residents, intubated all of them, I would expect all of them to be a little bit hypotensive post intubation. Why? Like only one of them might have a pneumothorax from my intubation process. Maybe one other might be overly sedated, but the other four would be hypotensive despite nothing being wrong. Why would somebody be hypotensive post-intubation? Perfect, because right now you are breathing spontaneously, meaning when you breathe in, you expand your chest, that drops the pressure in the chest, which draws venous return back to the heart. The opposite happens post-intubation, where now the machine is pushing in a breath, raising the pressure in the chest, which is impeding venous return. So you should anticipate some mild hypotension post-intubation. It's one of the many reasons you want to assure that you have adequate IV access when somebody's getting intubated. And most of the time, you just give a small fluid bolus, everything's fine. If a small fluid bolus doesn't take care of it, then you're a little more worried about your chest x-ray showing a pneumo or something else like that. So anticipate mild uh, hypotension post-intubation. Discuss, you know, most of these patients are going to need some sort of a, a enteral access, you know, sometimes to decompress with an NG tube, you know, sometimes to deliver things. In terms of an x-ray, uh, you know, think about the timing of this. If you're going to be putting in a central line, try to get the intubation and central line going together. So one x-ray at the bedside will accomplish both of those, maybe at the same time that the dob off is going in. So one film can cover all of those things. And not too long ago, I meaning just a couple of years ago, every patient got an x-ray every day. And, you know, now that's out, uh, you should get an x-ray when you need it, as opposed to by routine every morning. Um, talk about what meds the patient was getting, like maybe they don't need their vitamin D, they can go without that for a few days, you know, but important meds need to be converted into uh, IV formulations or another reason to have a, a, a dab off in. In terms of an ABG, I always get one, at the end of me getting the patient settled on the vent, meaning I took Nick, I gave him ACVC 12, 60 C's per ideal uh, uh, body weight, 100% um, five of PEEP, and I'll drop the FiO2 down and go up on the PEEP and maybe change the rate and something or other. And once I have them kind of fiddled at the bedside, I'll check one ABG to make sure everything is actually okay. Because I can measure his oxygen with a pulse ox, but I can't look into a CO2 soul to tell what that value is. So I'll get one ABG to make sure the pH and C2 are, CO2 are okay. Thereafter, it's up to you. You know, if you have a complicated patient, you're gonna want an art line in. So, cause you're gonna be checking ABGs frequently. Other patients, you can get by without that. Most patients end up uh, getting, you know, breathing treatments, NEBS uh, put into the regimen. But this is like a general set of things that you ought to think about. And I'm realizing as I'm talking about this, that even since a year ago, there's probably like an initial ventilator set of orders that covers these things. Is that right? Okay, if anybody isn't familiar how to access that, it's probably a good time to uh, figure out how to access that so that you can cover all of these things. And any, any bits of feedback from the older folks in the um, room of like things you learned during internship when a patient initially got intubated that uh, you wish you would have known ahead of time? Yeah. Oh yeah. What else? And then one other little thing, I can't tell you how many times this has happened that family members you know, left yesterday and the patient was minding their own business on the third floor and they come in the next morning, seemingly just an hour after, after the patient has gone through this and been moved to the unit. You know, the room after that process looks like a mash unit you know, from Afghanistan. And that's very distressing to the family members. So make sure you call them uh, and so that they're aware of what just happened. Good point. That's a great resource now, the difficult, difficult airway or DART, difficult airway response team, right? 
All right. Um, then, you know, every attending has their own um, idiosyncrasies and you learn those. My idiosyncrasies just happen to be right. So I believe that this is how you should be presenting the ventilator data each morning on rounds. I want to know every single detail of exactly how many milligrams of ceftriaxone you gave it. No, I don't wanna know those things. I want you to tell me just in broad strokes, what happened since I last saw the patient last night? Like it would be nice to know they went and got a lung transplant overnight. If nothing happened overnight, fine. Then how are they this morning? And specifically regarding the pressors, a little bit of a pet peeve that occasionally, occasionally I'll, frequently, I'll hear somebody report the patient is being stable hemodynamically. Meanwhile, they're on four pressors and a balloon pump. Okay, you might say MAP is at target on this dose of these different pressors. Okay, so just think about that. A very focused exam. And then the ventilator settings. You know, I know that on rounds when there's like six people standing there and the student is presenting the patient that at best I'm listening to the student. I know everybody else is daydreaming about when a round's gonna end, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, the only way there's any hope that we're all going to assimilate all the data from the ICU efficiently is if we report it in a systematic and logical fashion. So ventilator settings should be given in the order of ventilation related parameters followed by oxygenation related parameters. And all those are, all those are the, although there is a little overlap, the way this is done is you give the mode, the rate, and the volume, because that's the way in which I'm getting air in and out of the patient. How am I ventilating them? Or in pressure control, the mode, pressure control, the rate, the PIP, and the eye time. That's how I'm getting air in and out, followed by the PEEP and the FiO2, because that's how I'm oxygenating the patient. And if you want to have fun on rounds, but then subsequently be fired, um, present to me, you know, the patient's on assist control with a PEEP of five, a tidal volume of 400, an FiO2 of, I, I'm gonna seize, which is a little entertaining, but it's the end of your days in our program. Um, so this is the way in which the setting should be communicated. And the same thing goes with the ABG results. pH and pCO2 demonstrate the consequence of how you're ventilating the patient, how you're getting CO2 in and out of the patient, followed by the PO2 and the O2 sat. So pH, pCO2, PO2, O2 set. It's an idiosyncrasy, but I'm right, okay? And then you wanna say what's actually happening with the patient. Like that, you may have a set rate of 12, but if they're breathing 30 times a minute, you know, we want to address that. Um, and then this is gonna be a little complicated. It'll take no, no more than five minutes, we'll get through it. You know, until you're applying this in the unit when it's a need to know basis, you're not gonna care about it. But when you are in that setting, maybe you'll have a little recollection of this. So you're gonna report the peak and the plateau pressures, which allow you to then calculate the resistance and the compliance. Why do we care about calculating resistance and compliance? Is it helps you figure out what's wrong with the patient, okay? And your best way of fixing a problem is knowing what the problem is. And in the ICU, you have one goal each day and that's discharging patients from your service. And the ideal way is um, post successful extubation and knowing whether they have elevated airways resistance or reduced respiratory system compliance may help you achieve that goal. So I used up one minute, a five more on the complicated peak and plateau pressure. So unless you change something on the ventilator, there will always be a displayed a airway pressure versus time graph showing as the breath goes in, the airway pressure rising, and then as the patient exhales, the pressure coming back down to the peak. This is just what it's gonna look like. If you press, the inspiratory pause button. What happens is that on the next breath and just that one breath, the machine is gonna push the breath in, but it's gonna pause for a second, closing the valves while the breath is in the patient before letting the breath out. So the pressure would go up to the peak pressure, then it would drop to this pause pressure that looks like a plateau. So it's called both an inspiratory pause or a plateau pressure. And then the breath goes out. By doing this, it allows us to determine how much of the total pressure needed by the ventilator to get the breath in is necessary to overcome airways resistance versus how much pressure is necessary to expand the lung and the chest wall. So the three different graphs, tidal volume, breath goes in. This is flow, inspiratory flow on top, expiratory on the bottom. So the flow went in and then it was held because the ventilator paused for half a second 
no flow at all, and that had the peak pressure drop to this plateau pressure. So the ventilator, when it's pushing air in, is pushing that air in generating pressure to overcome two things, airways resistance and the elastance of the lung and chest wall. When you press the plateau, the pause button and get this plateau pressure, it divides those, those pressure gradients into two different components, the pressure necessary to overcome resistance versus the pressure necessary to expand the lung and chest wall. So the math is pretty simple. You're gonna be asked to calculate this uh, or you, you should calculate it on any MIC patient that has any sort of complicated situation going on. If somebody got intubated because of a drug overdose, we're not gonna care about this. But if somebody got intubated because of ARDS or you know, emphysema, you know, pulmonary fibrosis, these things are critical. So airways resistance is the peak pressure minus the plateau pressure, which is obtained after pressing that inspiratory pause button, divided by the flow rate. Now, as soon as I put the flow rate up, I know most of you say, okay, I'll just get that question wrong on rounds when Tobin is pimping. But unless you change the flow rate on the machine, the flow rate is always gonna be listed as 60 liters per minute, 60 per minute, which translates into one per second. So this equation becomes pretty simple. Peak pressure minus plateau pressure divided by one. Okay, pretty simple and a normal resistance is less than 10. If the resistance is super high, you're gonna to have to figure out why. Is it that the ET tube is crusted or the patient's biting it? Maybe you need a new ET tube or more sedation. Or is it bronchospasm? In which case you're gonna give them bronchodilators, uh, maybe steroids and antibiotics. So resistance, peak minus plateau. Compliance, also pretty simple. You know the formula for compliance is always delta V over delta P. So the delta V here is your tidal volume in CCs divided by the plateau pressure minus the peak. And normal values are greater than 60. When the values are less than 20, it means it's a stiff respiratory system, which could be morbid obesity, could be kyphoscoliosis, could be ascites pushing up, or could be intrinsic lung disease. So if you have low compliance, you go look at the patient. You know, Is it not 50 pounds overweight, but 400 pounds overweight could do this? Is the patient completely kyphoscoliotic? You look at the patient with your ultrasound probe to see are there ascites that could be improved by drainage and look for an effusion. So this is something you're gonna do on a regular basis. There's a couple other steps to this. So the first time you do it, make sure you have your senior resident or fellow with you because unfortunately to make these measurements, the patient has to be on a square wave profile, which I'll show you in a second, just so you know what it is, uh, but you really shouldn't be fiddling with that on your own. Questions about uh, peak and plateau pressure, resistance compliance. When you need to know it, this is the math. All right, that's just going through the same thing. Um, do no harm. We'd like low pressures. You know, we call it barotrauma because we want to minimize pressure causing trauma to the alveoli. But what really is happening is volume trauma, meaning an individual alveolus being over distended and by Laplace's law then rupturing. But we have no easy way of measuring the, the volume of individual alveoli. So we rely upon a plateau pressure being less than 32 as a, as a target. But keep in mind, I took Magda, tubed her, um, and bagged her. I would only have to generate maybe 10 centimeters of water to get a full tidal volume in. So 10, if we're accepting 32, that's a lot of pressure. So you'd really like as low a pressure as you can. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna briefly go through this flow rate and square wave just so you're familiar with it. Normal flow rate is normal. You can change the flow rate though to higher or lower. And some people like it higher or lower, but there are consequences to making it higher or lower. And at night, well, first of all, what is, what is the, the, the first rule of ICU medicine? Make the beeping stop. ICUs exist because of the nurses and the monitors, not because of the doctors. And the number one cause of beeping in the ICU is when the ventilator's peak pressure alarm fires. Meaning you told the ventilator to push in a certain volume and it's gonna push it in, but if it's taking too much pressure, it's gonna beep. So at night, ramp wave ferries, which I'll describe what that is, run through our ICUs and change people from square waves to ramp waves. The ramp wave ferries come in three life forms which include the bedside nurse who's tired of the beeping, the respiratory therapist who's tired of the beeping, 
and a creative intern who figures out that by going from square wave to ramp wave, the beeping stops. Most of the time it's okay, but you ought to be familiar with what it means to go from a square wave to the ramp wave and to just think about the potential consequences when you do that. So unless you change it, the machine is gonna deliver the tidal volume in this square wave fashion. What does it mean? It means when it's time to deliver the breath, it's gonna deliver it at a 60 liter per minute from start until finish of delivery of the breath. That's not really how we breathe. If you remember from a flow volume loop, the bottom part of the loop is like a semi-lunar thing. We kind of build up some flow rate and then it goes down. We don't like that. And yet our ventilators are set with this square wave fashion to it. So what this means is when you're in this square wave, it's a constant flow until the breath is delivered. If you do this decelerating or ramp wave picture, it on average delivers the same tidal volume over a longer period of time. And by pushing it in over a longer period of time, the peak pressure goes down. So it's a way of making the beeping stop going from a square wave to a ramp wave, the peak pressures go down. But you have to choose your poison. We don't like peak pressures because of the beeping and perhaps barotrauma from that. But if you put the breath in over a longer period of time, this is trying to demonstrate on the top, the inspiratory flow, and on the bottom, the expiratory flow, which here you can see that there was still flow ongoing when the next breath started. If you make the inspiration too long, there isn't time for expiration and you get auto peep. And we don't like auto peep either. So just be aware when you are tempted to make the beeping stop by changing from square wave to ramp wave, that it'll make the peak pressures go down, but you could be putting the patient at risk of auto peep. And what's the risk of auto peep? Well, that reduces venous return, leads to hypotension and shock. So just to be aware of that as you're making that um, consideration. So we're not gonna go further through that. I'm gonna mention patient ventilator dyssynchrony. Have any of you heard the term double stacking? Yeah, that is always, um, when that happens, it's always because the patient was not happy with the breath they just received and was still inspiring when that breath from the machine was done. And that triggers the machine to give another breath. So when you see double triggering, Think about this slide. So here's our tidal volume, square wave, pressure going up. What would happen to this pressure curve if the patient were to be breathing in on their own at the same time the machine was pushing a breath in? This is demonstrating the machine pushing in and the patient completely relaxed, which is what you'd like. When the machine's breathing for the patient, you don't want them making muscle effort, you want them relaxed. What would happen to the shape of this curve if the patient were to be breathing in at the same time the machine is pushing a breath in? What was that? A oh, scooping, exactly right. If the patient is breathing in, it's gonna lower the pressure here. Oops, oh no. What did I do here? There we go. Um, so the pressure would get, the, the flow, uh, the airway pressure versus time curve would get this scooping even to the point where sometimes you get a negative deflection. And if that negative deflection reaches the two centimeter threshold that even Matt Collins can generate, that'll trigger the delivery of another breath. So old people look at the, the, the screen to look for this scooping. Because if they're scooping, it means the patient is activating their diaphragm when they shouldn't have to be activating their diaphragm. And in you know, modern mechanical ventilation, in medical ICUs, our goal is to rest the patient when they're on the ventilator. And therefore, when we see this scooping, we know that we're not accomplishing that goal of resting. Okay, and if that negative pressure is too much, the patient double triggers, you get double, uh, double breath stacking. Auto peep, you're gonna hear mentioned, just so you know, comes up. If you're gonna check for auto peep, you press the expiratory pause button, not the inspiratory. And you look at the flow tracing to see if the expiratory flow, which is on the bottom, fails to get to zero before the next breath goes in. I'm not gonna go through any more of that. That's too complicated. And I'm gonna finish with troubleshooting issues because it's largely what interns and call nights are doing is shooting trouble. So if you see a patient that has 
high peak pressures. The most common cause of like beeping in the ICU, so nurses are gonna call you for this, throw caution in the wind and go look at the patient, okay? If they're like violent, their rash is too high, um, they're biting on the tube, that's gonna be the reason. And uh, nothing on the ventilator is gonna fix that. So, you know, you'd wanna address those issues, maybe putting in a bite block so they're not pinching the ET tube, uh, addressing their sedation strategy. And um, watch the nurses and respiratory therapists do this, but at the end of the ET tube is a suction catheter that you can pass through the ET tube. And if it's not blocked, it goes through very smoothly. Whereas if you're having to like push hard to get that suction catheter through the ET tube, then the problem with the peak pressures is mechanical in nature. And you gotta get a mechanic. So a surgeon come and put in a new uh, 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 ENT tube. And then you can check the peak and plateau pressures to look for that. And your strategies include lowering the tidal volume, the flow rates, or sedating the patient more. So peak pressures. Um, you're gonna be asked to check endotracheal tube positioning. You know, the anesthesiologist puts it in. Most of the time it's in the right spot, but we use the x-ray to confirm that. Two criteria to say that the ET tube is in the right place. One is that it's in the trachea, okay, literally anywhere below the vocal cords. And then you don't want it abutting uh, the crina. So you'd like it at least two centimeters above the crina. And measuring that is not always like real clear on the x-ray. You gotta squint a little bit, adjust the contrast, but you'd like to estimate where the crina is and then measure that the ET tube is at least two centimeters above the crina. Now, question here. Many times on the x-ray, you can't see the patient's chin. Like the x-ray was here. If that patient lowers their chin subsequently, what does that do to the tip of the ET tube? Does it push it in further or pull it out further when the patient bends their chin forward? Any normal person, no, but it doesn't work that way. The tip of the ET tube follows the tip of the chin. So if on your x-ray, you can't see the chin and the ET tube is kind of close to the crina, that means if they bend their head forward at some point, it's gonna push it down even further. Whether that makes sense or not, it's a fact. The tip of the ET tube follows the uh, tip of the chin on the x-ray. And then one other thing that you ought to just be aware of is that when you check the x-ray and you identify the ET tube is in the right place, somebody, respiratory therapy or the, or, or the nurse, will document how many centimeters in on the ET tube at the corner of the lip was right. So there are average distances, but everybody's different. And if in this patient, if this is correct endotracheal tube positioning, we would say that was with the ET tube at 24 centimeters at the corner of the lip. If tomorrow you come in and now 24 is way out here, it means the patient's starting to like tongue the ET tube out. Or if it's further in, that can help be a clue that maybe she get an x-ray at that point in time to double check those things. More troubleshooting. Patients desaturating, um, your go-to maneuver should be to just disconnect the, the ventilator and bag. You know, a little desaturation between friends, you don't have to do that, but um, you know, significant desaturation isn't the time to fiddle with like a subtle adjustment of one of the ventilator settings. Bag the patient up. So your go-to reaction for any significant uh, desaturation should be to bag the patient. Um, when it comes time to extubate, we on purposely deflate the cuff to make sure there is a cuff leak, but that's during weaning. The rest of the time, you don't want a leaky cuff. So how would you know you have a leaky cuff? Is if the machine is programmed to deliver 450 cc's in, but the reported exhaled tidal volume is only 200 cc's, that would imply that there's a leaky cuff. Best thing to do, like for all of these things, ask respiratory to come see the patient. Um, the first thing they'll do is put a little more air into the uh, uh, balloon and see if that uh, takes care of it. If not, uh, you've got to um, replace the, the endotracheal tube. The balloon sometimes just lose their, their structure. If a patient self-extubates, your gut reaction should be just to call respiratory and reintubate the patient, okay? If you happen to be there though, you do have a window of opportunity to make a game time decision. Like, you know, occasionally you have a patient where you, you are anticipating tomorrow we're gonna check, you know, weaning parameters and go through that route. Um, you know, if you're there and can make an assessment that they're okay, uh, take advantage of that window. But unless you feel 
confident, you know, you're not right there, they, they paged you, this happened, your answer should be call uh, anesthesia to get the patient reintubated. Um, if a patient is in shock and they're on the vent, you ought to think about vent related reasons for that. So a pneumothorax, an auto peep, um, patient ventilator dyssynchrony, a little more subtle adjustments at the bedside. And I think this is important because I, I think it's important because I made this mistake at last time I was moonlighting, which was like a hundred years ago. I remember getting called to see a patient who had just had a trach placed a few hours earlier and the nurse called me saying the patient had like copped out the, the trach and it was sitting right there at the patient's bedside. I went, I looked at the patient, he, he looked like Collins looks like now. So I just took the trach and put it in. Called the, you know, the, the private docs at home saying, I'm taking care of your patients for you so you can sleep and whatnot. Um, and I just did this and he yelled at me. And the reason is, is appropriate. When you have a fresh trach, you know, one that's within the first couple of weeks of having been made, when you put the tracheostomy tube through the, the hole in the skin, who knows where it's gonna go beneath the skin. It could go into the soft tissue subcutaneously. It could go into the mediastinum. Probably the least likely thing is that it's gonna go into the edematous recent incision in the trachea. So if a fresh trach uh, falls out, call anesthesia to get the patient reintubated in a normal fashion. Other troubleshooting things, and this is really where I will end. Old folks or interns who encountered ventilator problems. All right, at some point, take a look at the patient as well. All right, have a good rest of the day. Hope the week is off to a good start. Thank you.